Today is our annual meeting of 2016. We will hear from Dr. Lauren Scott, who's going to tell us, to the best of his knowledge, what's up with the economy. Uh, we think that maybe there's a roller coaster effect going on in the, in the economy, and uh, we're helping people understand how they can be prepared, uh, what the effects are when industry has a downturn, either due to increased taxes or due to market conditions changing, um, how can the communities adjust and how can the plants adjust, what should they be doing, what should they be looking out for in a downturn, and when might the economy rebound, and how can they be prepared for that as well. So Gabria is a trade association whose members are 60 industrial plants around the Greater Baton Rouge area. We've been in existence for over 45 years, working on common issues that the plants have, such as safety and health improvements, um, workforce development and training, and uh, as most recently we're also working on improving uh, the traffic and infrastructure in the Baton Rouge area, which is also really important, a really important initiative that we're working on with uh, an, the group called Crisis. I'll call our annual meeting to order, and I'll ask that um, you approve all of our board of directors to continue in their positions as they are. And so uh, if you're not on the Gabriel uh, membership, you have to stay quiet, but if you are, you can say, uh, yes, hey, okay. Now, would anybody else like to be on the board? If you would, say you can vote no. And you'll be our next board member and the, the chairman, really, if you would like. We can, <laughs> we can definitely make that position. You can move right to the top of the board. Are there any no votes? No. Okay, well, thank you very much for approving our 2016 board of directors. What a good-looking group, huh? What a good-looking crew. Okay, um, we met, we meet each year. We met uh, back in February, and we go over our mission and our strategic objectives. Uh, there's really been no change to those over the course of the last few years. We continue to work in, the, in, in these areas. Uh, we're not about to give an update on each of those areas today, but just to let you know that uh, we, can, we continue uh, to work in our, in our strategic direction, safety, uh, workforce development, making sure that we've got a good financial position and that those finances are open and available for everyone to see and understand. Um, uh, I'm going to miss some of the others, but uh, on our uh, communications and, and all that. So um, we're going to continue. We really appreciate the membership continuing to participate and be, and be members. The, the organization is there for you. And really, we get out, you get out of it what you put into it. And now I can't even see it. I would be my glasses. I had a chance, but <laughs> we're good. Um, I'm, I can see here that I'm supposed to remind you that there are uh, antitrust guidelines in your folders. And of course, we always adhere to those. We never talk about the price of anything, even lunch. We don't talk about how much lunch costs or the volume of anything or the capacity that you have or how much of that capacity you're using. So if, if you uh, really want to read those in depth, uh, please do. So, but I'm really, th I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today, especially because I really enjoy listening to, uh, to Dr. Scott. You know, it's nice to have an, uh, an economist that knows something and can actually speak to you about it. Um, but I've been so disappointed because I've, I've taught, heard him speak maybe four or five times recently since I heard his last blonde joke. So I'll remember that 610 cap for as long as I live. Um, it's actually 710. <laughs> 710 cap? Okay. Well, great. So if you, if you saw that, that, that talk, then you're aware of it. But it was a good joke. But I suppose those are no longer politically correct enough to, to get away with. So, um, Connie, you want to do the complete introduction? Thanks. All right. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lauren C. Scott. 
He is the president and founder of Lawrence C. Scott & Associates. He was on the economics department faculty at Louisiana State University from 1969 to 1998, where he rose through the ranks from assistant professor to the holder of the Freeport McMoran Endowed Chair of Economics. He is presently Professor Emeritus of Economics at LSU. Over the 13-year period from 1983 to 96, Dr. Scott was the chairman of the economics department at LSU. During that time, the department's ranking among the 3,000 economics departments in the U.S. rose from 101st place to 38th. He received seven awards at LSU for outstanding classroom teaching. And I have to say that I was a student of Dr. Scott's at one, at one time, and he was a great professor, so appreciate you. Dr. Scott is co-developer of the Louisiana Econom Econometric Model, a model used for providing annual forecasts of the Louisiana economy, which are released each fall. He was a co-investigator on over $1 million in grant research at LSU, and is the author of over 75 articles and technical reports, in addition to reports written for consulting clients. So please help me welcome Dr. Lauren Scott. Well, it's good to be in front of this group and see former students here and, uh, and people that I get to work with a lot. And get, I appreciate many of you who answered my phone calls that I make about this time every year, trying to find out what's going on out there in, uh, out there in the real world. Um, the blonde joke prop, that is a problem. Uh, it, matter of fact, the problem with being a speaker on economics is that you, you absolutely have to inject some humor now and then or people will yawn out on you, which creates a problem for us because of this political correctness thing. You, there, there, you just can't, there's always going to be some group that's offended. But I found this one group that you can offend and nobody cares, and that's the Hittites. There hasn't been a Hittite on the planet since about 400 BC, so I can tell you all a Hittite story, it'll be all right, right? So there was the two Hittites. One was named Boudreau and one was named Gautreau. <laughs> so Boudreau decides he's gonna go to France to visit his ancestors. So he gets on this plane, this Delta flight that goes from, well, from New Orleans <laughs> to, uh, to Atlanta. Then he gets on one of the real wide-bodied uh, Delta flights where you have two seats, four seats, two seats. And he gets the window seat, and this guy, he, he, he gets the aisle seat, actually. And the guy in the window seat is sitting over there, and he's got these earphones on, listening very intently to these earphones. And the Buddha's like, I wonder what's going on here. So finally, the plane takes off, and the stewardess come around with the meals, and they serve the meals. The guy takes his earphones, and he said, said I'm Boudreau. Who are you? He said, my name is Gotro. He said, you're kidding, really. He said, what are you, what, what, what you doing on the plane? He said, well, I'm going to... France to visit my ancestors. He said, you're kidding. I'm doing exactly the same thing. Look, I noticed that while I go on the plane, you had these earphones on plugged into the jack there. What, what, what are you doing with that? He said, well, you know, oddly enough, I don't know how to speak French. And they got this little program here on the plane. We're going to be on the plane for, plane for seven hours, right? They got this little program on the plane where you can listen, you know, listen to French lessons. You know, I can learn how, at least how to order a cab and order a meal at the restaurant. But also, that is great. I don't speak French either. This is perfect. So the stewardess comes around, picks up the stuff, and Boudreau gets some earphones from her, plugs it into the jack, and his eyes get about this big around. For seven hours, he's listening very, very intently. The plane lands in Paris. He goes, gets his luggage, goes out the cab stand, and the guy says, Bonjour, monsieur, come in. And Boudreau looks at him and says, <laughs> So anyway, I love that story. Other kind of impressions, I got to walk in, and I, you, you saw behind the desk over there, this, uh, the last time I was in this room, my wife was inducted into the LSU Alumni Hall of Distinction, so her picture is going to show up over this tough woman, smart, smart gal. We had, you, you ever had one of these dumb conversations between spouses, you know, like uh, I, I asked her one time, I said, Peggy, what if I did something really stupid out there and we lost everything? Would you still love me? She said, I Lauren, I can't believe you asked me that question. That's the dumbest question. Of course I would love you. I can't believe you asked me. Of course I would love you. I would miss you, but I would still, I would still love you. So I'm going to talk to you today about my best shot at, at understanding the oil and gas industry out there right now, which is a very, we're in a very peculiar time. And I'm going to tell you that I think I know what I'm talking about, but that may not be the case. I actually just got back from the doctor getting a shot in the hip, and it reminded me 
Uh, I had been limping for some time because of bursitis and all this old age junk. But anyway, I was reminded of the story about this doc that was taking around some medical students and showing them, teaching them all different kinds of things. And he said, this is Mr. Mr. Allen. And Mr. Allen walks with a limp. And if you look at the x-ray here, you can see that his fibula and his tibia are radically arched. Then he looks at Mr. Allen and said, what would you do in this case? Mr. Allen said, well, I'd probably walk with a limp too. All right. So it wasn't such a good story. All right. Now, this is where y'all are supposed to laugh. Okay, anyway. This is going to be a tough group. All right, well, let me talk to you a little bit about what's going on. What I want to do is to tell you a little story, uh, and it's going to be a little bit lengthy story to get to the main point, and that is to help us to understand how we got in this position. Why is the price of oil, how, why did the price of oil drop? Why did it drop so sharply? And what does that have to do with a lot of people in this audience who produce something made out of natural gas? And so what I want to do is I want to start with this, uh, with this, this thing here. We'll start with the shale plays. The shale play, U.S. oil production is up 85% since 2008 because of the shale plays. And that's a remarkable statement. There's no other country in the world that has had that kind of increase in production during that time period. Now, one of the, out, one of the ramifications of that, one of the uh, impacts of that is this chart, chart right here. If you look back in 2008, the United States was importing about 66% of the crude oil that we consume in this country. By the time you get to 2015, which is not that long, which is about eight years later, guess what? We're only importing about 44% of the crude oil that we consume in this country. And there was one country that lost about 500,000 barrels of oil a day of sales in the United States. And they did not like that. So I want you to kind of remember this chart because we're going to come back to it in just a minute. Each one of these shell plays is really different. When you learn how to drill in the Gulf of Mexico, deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico, which, by the way, I think they're doing stuff out there way more difficult than landing a person on the moon, way more technologically difficult. When you learn something, some new technique for drilling in the deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico, that is pretty much transferable to the North Sea, to offshore Brazil, to offshore Alaska. That is not necessarily the case with, with, when it comes to the shell plates. For example, I've been to the Bakken play about three times in the last four years. Look at look, in North Dakota, look what is happening. In 2003, they were producing 10,000 barrels of oil per day. They are now producing 1.2 million barrels of oil per day. They, they passed Alaska as the number three producer of oil. They're about 100,000 barrels away from passing us as the number two producer of oil. Now, what happens in, in, the, in the Bakken play is you, you drill down vertically about two miles, and then you hit shale rock, and you go horizontally across that, and then you take this horizontal part and you break it up into stages. They used to break it up about 16. Now they break it up about 64. But you start down here in the very end and you create explosions in that stage. And the explosions cause cracks to occur in the rock. Then you pump a lot of water, a little bit of sand, well, actually a lot of sand, a little bit of chemicals down there. And the water, sand, and the chemicals keep the crack open so that the oil and the natural gas can come flowing out. That's the way it is done in the Bakken play. Now, we have our own shale play here. Actually, we have our own oil shale play here in Louisiana, and that's the Tuscaloosa Marine Shale running right here across the middle of the state. When you drill down horizontally into the Tuscaloosa Marine Shale, you don't hit solid rock. You hit a clayey substance. So you drill down, you hit that, you go vertically, horizontally across that, break it up into stages, you create your explosions. The dead gum cracks don't stay open because it's clayey stuff. And it wasn't until about 18, 24 months ago that an outfit called Goodrich Resources, which is now declared bankruptcy, figured out a clue, figured out the code on how to keep those cracks open and make it work. But as it, because these different shell plays are very different, here's what you're going to find. Each one of them has very different break-even points. Uh, for example, in the Bakken play, the break-even point might be $50 a barrel, while in the Tuscaloosa Marine Shale, it's $92 a barrel in the Louisiana portion. So guess what was the first area to start losing rigs quickly? Well, it was our own Tuscaloosa Marine Shale. Now, the good news is that we didn't have hardly any rigs operating there anyway. We had like 13 to 14, whereas up in the Bakken play, they had probably around, in the had 120, 130 rigs. Now, uh, what you will find is these numbers, like that Bakken number, Okay, rather, what, all these numbers, these numbers are about 24 months old. So what you will find over time is that all these numbers have been coming down. And the reason they've been coming down is because the people in this industry are smart, clever, greedy capitalists. 
They're just like you, right? Anybody in this room not a capitalist? We're all capitalists. Even ministers are capitalists. Have you ever heard of a minister that was called to a lower paying job? No, no, you haven't. But anyway, here's what you'll find. First of all, the fracking costs, the, you know, the sand and the, and the water and the chemicals has come down. A lot of costs have come down for the people who drill these things because guess what happened? Guess what those people in the Gulf of Mexico did? BP, Chevron, and Exxon, when the price of oil dropped from 100 down to 28, they went to people like Edison Schwest, who builds all the ships and operates all the ships, service the offshore oil and gas industry, and said, guess what, Mr. Schwest? Uh, we were getting $100 a barrel of oil. Now we're only getting $30 a barrel. You're going to have to give us a 33 45% discount on what you've been charging us. And Schwest says, oh, shoot. So Schwest then goes to Port Fouchon and Chet Chason at Port Fouchon and says, look, you know, we're getting 35% less than we used to get. You're going to have to give us a 35% cut on our lease fees there to Port. And then Chet calls up me. This is the bad part. Calls up me and says, Lauren, you know how you've been giving us economic consulting? <laughs> anyway, it's been shoveling down. It's been shoveling down. But the other thing is they've gotten more and more clever about drilling. Look at the time to drill. And a Darko in 2009 in the Bakken play, 18 days to drill a well, now down to seven and a half. EOG, uh, 20, uh, almost 23 uh, days to drill a hole, now it's down to seven. The completion cost is down a lot. Plus, they figured out clever ways to get more and more output per well. Just focus here on this blue line. Blue line starts in January of 07. January of 07 in the Bakken play, you drill a well, you're going to get about 100 barrels of oil per day. Look what had happened by the time you get to January 14 is up to 500 barrels of oil per day, and actually now it's at 767 barrels. It's way the heck up here. So they've become more and more clever about reducing the cost and getting more and more oil out of the ground, which has been something that at least one country in the world had not expected to occur. The other thing you need to notice about these, and this is a really important point, is that these numbers here are great averages. If you look at, a, the, say, the Bakken play, think of this big square that represents the Bakken play. If you drill in the great middle of that Bakken play, you don't have to drill down very far. And when you drill that sucker and frack it, I mean, the oil just comes gushing up. But if you get out on the edges of the play, you have to drill further down. And when you hit, the oil doesn't come up nearly as well. So what you will find is if you look in the Bakken play, there are great differences in the break-even point. If you are in the great middle part of the play where these green counties are, look how low the break-even point is. But if you get out on the edges, look out on the edges, how high the break-even point. And it is the edges. Every one of the shale plays in the United States has edges. Even the Gulf of Mexico has edges. And it is these edges that have really been under attack. The rig count has especially dropped to zero in most of these edges type counties. Now, the other thing that we have to take a little step back, if we want to understand why prices have done what they've done, we look, need to look at the weird effect that the Bakken play had on oil prices. If I'd given this talk to you folks back in 2008, here's what I would be able to say to you. Pick up the Wall Street Journal. Look in the Wall Street Journal under the price of oil. Here's what you would discover. The price of oil is the same everywhere in the world. I don't care if it's Saudi, Venezuelan crude, Mexican crude, West Texas Intermediate, North Sea oil. The price of oil is the same everywhere in the, everywhere in the world. And the reason for that is there's about 3,700 very large crude carriers floating on the surface of the ocean, taking oil wherever they can get the highest price. And you learn your principles of economics class, that has a tendency to keep the price of oil the same everywhere until the Bakken play came along. Those of you who are old Miss graduates, this is a map of the United States of America. <laughs> now, here is the, oh, a little sensitivity back there. All right. So here's the Bakken play. I saw your senior ring when you're picking your nose earlier. That's how I knew you're here. Anyway, oh, so here's the Bakken play up here. Now you get the you, you get making all these oil up here, but the problem is you got to get this oil from the Bakken play down here to the Gulf Coast where the refineries are. Now one of your problems is there's hardly any pipelines running in this direction. Hardly any pipelines up there at all. There are enough pipelines in this little state right here. Enough, enough miles of pipelines in the state of Louisiana to circle the globe four and a half times. There aren't any pipelines up there. So they're trying to get that oil any way they could down to the coast. Trains mainly, trucks, whatever. Now what they would do is they would bring it from there to a place right here in Oklahoma called Cushing, Oklahoma. And when it got to Cushing, Oklahoma, it just kind of stacked up there. And the reason it stacked up is there weren't enough pipelines to bring the oil from Cushing, Oklahoma down to the coast. 
And when that happened, as it turns out, Cushing is where the price of West Texas Intermediate is set. And so when all that bottleneck occurred and all that oil started piling up at, uh, at Cushing, Oklahoma, for the very first time that I'm aware of, the price of West Texas Intermediate started di di uh, diverting from the world price, sometimes by as much as $20 a barrel. Now, if you produce West Texas Intermediate, you don't like that. And so you're smart, clever, greedy capitalists. You want to fix this problem. And so what they did was they took a pipeline that was running uh, south to north up there called the Seaway Pipeline, and they reversed it. It took about 18 months to do that. And then there were two other pipelines that were built going from Cushing down to the coast. And when that happened, they got rid of the bottleneck in Cushing. And as a result, guess what happened to the price of West Texas Intermediate and the, and the world price? It came back together again until all the oil showed up down on the coast at our refineries. And when it got there, another bottleneck occurred. It started piling up again. And the reason for that is this oil coming down from the Bakken plate is very sweet crude. And most of these refineries are designed to produce very heavy crude or refine very heavy crude. Well, this is a, so once again, we had a bottleneck and look, look what happened. The price of West Texas Intermediate versus the world price. It diverged again. And so people who produce West Texas Intermediate get, you know, 20 bucks off the world price. They don't like that. They're smart, clever, greedy capitalists. They want as much as they can get. They want at least the world price. And so they said, how can we fix this problem? Why don't we just export the dadgum oil? Well, the problem with that is, and I think this is the key to the recent price decline, the problem with that is the export of crude oil had been illegal until this last year, had been illegal since the middle of the 1970s. However, I don't know if you knew this or not, but it is perfectly okay to export petroleum products. That's legal. You could export all the gas, all the diesel that you wanted to. So if you're a smart, clever, creative capitalist, you say, well, <clears throat> what is a product? Hmm. Do, do I have to spend three, two to three billion dollars to retrofit the Marathon refinery to be able to handle heavy crude or could I just build this unit, little unit out in the Eagle Ford in Texas? It cost me about half a million bucks. And all it's going to do is going to take a barrel of oil and skim off the top of it a little bit of the volatile gases on the top. Is the result a product? Well, in August of 14, a very important date, a company went to the Department of Commerce and said, is this a product? And the Department of Commerce said, well, yeah. Then another company with the Department of Commerce and said, is that a, really a product? And they said, yeah. And pretty soon, nobody went to the Department of Commerce anymore to ask. They just started building these little units so they could export this product. And that is an important date in October 14. Why have oil prices declined? And more importantly, why did they drop so quickly? Oil, you might say, well, it was because of rising U.S. oil production. No, 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 no. U.S. oil production rose like this. Oil prices drop like that. They drop straight off a cliff. And to me, having watched this industry since back in the early 70s, when I see oil prices drop real fast like that, I always look to the Saudis. And so what was going on here? Was this a desire of the Saudis to enforce, discipl enforce discipline back in, 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 in 1982? Remember, you were around in 1982. What happened in 19? Did you know the price of oil used to be the easiest thing in the economy to forecast? Today, it's the second most difficult thing in the economy to forecast, in my opinion. I taught forecasting for years at LSU, and it's the second most difficult thing to forecast. Uh, uh, it, but it used to be the easiest thing to forecast because from about, you go back to 1950 to about the early part of 1970, that two and a half decades, the price of oil was the same for two and a half decades. It was between $2.50 and $3 a barrel for two and a half decades. And then this group of countries, about 13 of them, mainly in the Middle East, got together and said, you know, we had principles of economics someplace. I wonder, instead of all of us just producing as much as we can, why don't we get together as a group? We'll call ourselves OPEC. And what we'll do is instead of producing all we can produce, let's all turn the faucet back a little bit. Take some oil off the market, supply and demand. Let's see what happens to the price of oil. So they did. And the price of oil went from $2.50 to $35.50 at one point in the early part of 1981, latter part of 1981. I said, this is great. They were making piles of money. Now, the only problem with this little scheme, and you learned about this in Principles of Economics, 
is that one of the problems with, oh, with cartels like this, they are inherently unstable. And the reason for that is individual members of the cartel learn early on, if you cheat just a little bit on your quota, you make lots of money. I don't have to explain greed. So guess what happened in the latter part of 1981? Price of oil, 80, you know, 35, 50 million. So what would happen is Iran would produce 500,000 barrels more than they're supposed to, and the Saudis at the top, who are the biggest producers, would say, oh, shoot, we want to keep the price high, so we'll reduce our output by 500 barrels. And then Iran would produce 100,000 barrels more than they're supposed to. The Saudis would say, oh, shoot, we'll reduce our output by 100,000 barrels. We'll be the swing producer. We've got to keep that price up. Can you see where after a while that would give the Saudis the red, uh, make the Saudis mad? And so finally, in a lot of part of 1981, the Saudis said, well, you don't want to see what cheating's all about? Let me show you what cheating's all about. They turned on the faucet. Boom. The price of oil dropped from $35.50 in December of 81 to $10.50 the following summer. $10.50. And when that happened, suddenly all the hands went near. All the other members of the Hopet cartel said, let's have a meeting. We promise that we will never violate our quotas again. Just take that oil off the market, get the price back up. So they had a meeting, and they restored their quotas. Price of oil went back up again. Is that what happened here? Is that what's going on here? Was it restoring uh, the discipline within the OPEC? No, that's not what happened here. What happened here, put yourself in the place of the Saudis. Remember the second chart I showed you, which showed that our, our imports of oil went from 66% down to 44%. I said there was one country that lost 500,000 barrels of sales in the United States. That was the Saudis. Then in August, they learned that these two companies went to the Department of Commerce and said, can we export this product? And the Department of Commerce said yes. And the Saudis said, hell no. They turned on the faucet. Boom. The price of oil was down all the way that you saw to $28 a barrel at one point. And, of course, the first thing that happened was all the hands went up. We, let's have a meeting. November of 2014, let's have a meeting. And they had a meeting, and the Saudi, they came out of the meeting and said, the Saudi said, nope, we're going to soldier on. Because what we want to do is we want to kill the edges of all these shell plays. If we can kill the edges, production in the United States will go down, and they won't be a threat to us anymore. So... The impact is already occurring, as it turns out. This is the picture of oil production in the United States from 2011 through about, um, I, this is about, um, this is about uh, uh, February, I think, of this year. You'll notice, see this big increase right here, this big increase? That's the 85% that's the, uh, the the increase in production in the United States due to the shale play. And, but look what's been happening now. And by the way, this is now a, it peaked at 9.6 million barrels a day. It is estimated it will be all the way down to right in here around 8.1 million barrels a day by the time we get to the end of this year. U.S. oil production is declining. And the primary reason it's declining is because of this picture right here. This is the picture of a typical decline curve in any, in any shale play. What happens is it is a very steep decline curve. Basically, between the first year and the second year, output declines 65%. Between the second year and the third year, it declines 35%. I mean, it drops like a son of a gun. Now, if you're drilling the deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico, the decline curve is more smooth like this. But when you drill in that shale play, it is a very steep decline curve. The only way you can keep output growing in the United States is to continually drill and drill and drill more and more to replace the oil that is dropping off the charts here. And guess what has been happening to the rig count? The rig count is now down, what does that say? Uh, can you read more? Hand? Down 78% since it peaked back there. The rig count is falling right straight through the floor. And so what you can expect is U.S. output is going to continue to fall. Now, production would have been down even further with not what was going on in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, what's going to happen for the next two years, you can see output increase in the Gulf of Mexico. You can't read this from where you are, but in 2015, there are two, four, six, there are eight big projects that came online in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, these are projects that were designed, put in place about 10 years ago. So they're going to come online. If you look at the uh, what's going to happen in 2016 and 2017, 246, there are six others that are coming online. Again, these are projects that were designed and thought about and planned for uh, 8 to 10 years ago. And so you're going to get some increase. This is going to help offset some of that increase 
that uh, uh, offset some of that decrease that's going to come from the shale plates. Now, there's been very, uh, I hope, we, is this all right? We, we communicating okay? I want to make sure I'm not, I'm not communicating the wrong thing. I, as I thought about this, I was, I was thinking about this high school coach who was leading his team to the state championships, and they were in the middle, they were in the middle, of the, towards the end of the game, they were down five points, and his first string quarterback had gotten knocked out. His second string quarterback got knocked out. So he had to use his third string quarterback, who, to be very polite, was football challenged in a lot of ways. He, so he said, go in there, I want you to run this play. So he goes in there, and to everybody's amazing. The coach he sat, the people in the stands, everybody, everybody. The third string quarterback changes the play at the line of scrimmage. 14, 14, 14. The run play 14. He hands it off the halfback. Halfback goes right up straight up through the middle all the way to the end zone, makes a touchdown to win the game. Crowd goes crazy. The coach pulls the ball off the side and says, son, why did you change the play at the line of scrimmage? He said, well, coach, I got under center and I looked up and I saw these two linebackers, big old guys. One was number six, one was number seven. I added them together, got 14, so I called play 14. <laughs> the coach looks at his son, seven and six does not add up to 14. He said, coach, if I was as smart as you, we'd have lost the game. <laughs> so look what the response. I mean, you've seen, the, you've seen these charts now. You've seen, the, you've seen what's happened to the price. Well, look what the response of the companies has been. BP, reducing their spending from 26 down to 17 billion, laying off 7,000. Shell laid off 10,000, reducing their operating budgets by 12.5 billion. Chevron eliminating 8,000 jobs. If you're on the North Shore of, the, of, of, of New Orleans, that's a bad plan. Cutting the spending by 3.7 billion. ConocoPhillips cutting their capital spending from 16 down to 5.7 billion, a decline of 64 percent, and they are dropping out of the deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico. This is what the low prices are doing to some folks. Now, if you're at Homa and you're in Lafayette, you're saying, oh. Shoot, because what Conical Phillips has said, you know, high risk but high reward out there. I'd rather go to the Permian Basin in West Texas where it's very low risk and lower reward, but that's what we're going to do. We're not going to take these high risk out in the deep water Gulf of Mexico. Exxon CapEx budget is down uh, uh, about what you can see there, about 15 billion, a 40% decline. Freeport McMoran's CapEx budget is down 46%. Anadarko is down 70% from what it was in 2014. Uh, the Energy Information Administration said that there are 40 publicly traded U.S. oil companies that lost $67 billion last year. If you look at the spending by types of spending between 2014 and 2016, look what happened to drilling spending. These numbers are in millions, so this is $194 billion. Look at the decline in production spending. The total decline over time is 62%, 62% decline in spending. Uh, if you look at oil prices... This is a picture of the oil price from the kind of peak back here in August the 1st of 2014. This is what it's done. Now, some of us have gotten pretty excited about this latest little bump. You see this little bump upward that occurred? It went from about 20, about, especially about 35 up to about 45 today. Now, I need to tell you something about don't get too excited about that because there are three things that happened recently that have caused a temporary bump in the price of oil. One is there was a pipeline disruption in Nigeria. Nigeria's They've got a lot of problems there. There was another transportation issue in Iraq. There was a strike among oil workers in Kuwait. Those three things took 1.85 million barrels of oil a day off the market. Okay, and so you've got an increase in the price as a result of that. Now, when those three things get settled, guess what's going to happen to the price? It's probably going to drop back down again. Uh, so, uh, now, let me, let, let's, let's look at, I'm going to show you my oil forecast, price forecast, but let's look at what the market is saying. And let me... Uh, I've learned a lot in the last year from talking to a trading a guy who worked on the trading floor of the Chicago Exchange. He says, right now, if you went back to September of 24, the September 24th of 2015, did that ever come out? Did I ever say that right? I don't think I ever said it right. September 24th, 2015, the spot price was 44.48. The futures price for uh, June was 48. The futures price for December of 16 was 50.63. The market is in what is called ta contango. When the spot price is below the futures price, the market is in contango. And your first thought was, hey, the market is saying the price of oil is going up. That's not what that says. 
That You might think, boy, this looks very bullish. No, this is a bearish signal. This price right here, this futures price, this $50.63, is not what the market says the price of oil is going to be. That's what the cost of storing the oil is going to be. And if that price is higher than the spot price, that must be there's going to be an a ocean of oil out there stocked up. Okay, So you're going to pay a high price, too much oil, which means the futures price should be, I mean, the price of oil in the future is going to be going down. Remember, this is a spot, this is, a, this is, the, this is the, the price of storing the oil. Now, I want you to notice something. Back in September, look at the difference between those prices there, between the spot and the futures December. It was about $6 a barrel. By the time you get to February, look at the difference in price. It had widened. It widened to $10 a barrel, which if you are a trader in the, in the, on the floor of the Chicago Exchange, that tells you it's getting more bearish. It's getting even worse. So when you see that distance between the spot and the futures price get wider, that means the market is even more contangled. It's even more bearish. That's the bad news. If you look at April, though, look what happened in April. Look at April spot versus the future in 2017. Now it's only down to about $5 a barrel. So what that's saying is the market is moving towards um, backwardation, where the spot price is ultimately going to get above the futures price, so th th this, this narrative demand means the market is starting to move towards bullish, which is good, a good sign for us. I hope you were able to follow that okay. Now, this is our forecast uh, for the future, uh, futures uh, for 2016, 2017. Our forecast for 2016 is the price will average around $45 a barrel and, and 2017 about $55 a barrel, around a fairly narrow range of $20 to $90 a barrel. Hey, I taught forecasting for 30 years to MBAs and executive MBAs. When you have something that is the second most difficult thing in the economy to forecast, you got to put wide confidence bands around that sucker. you got to tell people, you know, this is my best shot. This is my best shot at it. And that's exactly what this is, my best shot at it. This is a very, very difficult thing to forecast. Now, here's some pressure points for you to be watching out there. First of all, U.S. oil production is declining. And it's going to decline all the way through this year, probably all into next year. Lower output here should put upward pressure on the price. That would be good. The, the group to really be watching, uh, let me pass on this. The group to really be watching are the Saudis because they started all this. And let me tell you something. You learned principles of economics class. The demand for oil is very inelastic. And what that means is when the price goes down, so do your revenues. Okay? Sometimes when the price goes down, your revenues go up. Not when it's an inelastic demand curve. So what has happened with the Saudis and all the other people in the world, the price has gone down and the revenues have gone down as well. Even though they're selling a little bit more, it's gone down. So wh how long are the Saudis going to be able to keep this up? Well, let's look at their cash reserves. The cash reserves, they had a big stack of cash off on the side, $732 billion at the end of 2014. That is already down by $100 billion by the time you get to the end of 2015. So they're eating into those cash reserves big time. They are not going to let those cash reserves go to zero. They're not going to do that. They're going to change before that. Uh, the Saudis' internal spending cuts, look at this. 2015 and 2016, they've cut their internal spending cuts by 29%. So the average person in Saudi Arabia is seeing 29% cut in how much money they're getting. That's going to create a lot of unhappiness, and that's a problem for them in terms of keeping this up long term. If you look at their budget, they had a surplus of 12% of GDP. If their GDP in 2012, they now have a 22% deficit. So they've got all kinds of pressures on them that are going to prevent them from keeping this up very long. If you watch, read the Wall Street Journal today, the head of their, uh, their, their oil, oil, oil industry ministry said, we're going we're to keep producing output. We're, we think demand's going to go up. We're going to keep producing this 10.2 billion million barrels of oil per day. Well, okay, but how long are you going to be able to keep that up? So we've got to really especially pay attention to this top this cash reserve up here to see how much longer they can keep this up. Now, the other supply wild card is the Iranians. Uh, the sanctions were lifted in 2016 in a brilliant, just an absolutely brilliant uh, negotiating gambit on the part of our president. I wish they'd have sent my wife to do that. My wife is the best negotiator I know. We have this agreement that if we ever get a divorce, I would at least have the BMW to sleep in. I mean, that's, that's how it but here's what they say. We want to boost our output from 3.1 to 5.7 million barrels of oil per day. That is a lot of oil to put on the market. Now, uh, 
I don't think they're going to be able to do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, can this country expand like that in a low oil environment? Can they do that? Can they get people to come in and drill in a low oil environment? How about their infrastructure? Many of their pipelines are over 40 years old. They have a lot of leakages. They have a lot of problems there. Many Iranian operators like sophisticated well maintenance techniques. And then the, there's the makeup of the Iranian contracts. Uh, nobody gets to own these. You go in there to drill, you don't get to own the reserves. You just get, you get paid for coming in and drilling. But the problem is you, the, there are very severe restrictions on this, and they have this local content stuff. You have to hire a certain number of Iranian workers. They use a certain number of Iranian suppliers, okay? Which means, ultimately, you can only get the French to come in there and drill, as best I can tell. I don't know. Nobody else wants to go in. It's kind of like what's happening in Mexico. Those here are watching Mexico and wondering why the, the denationalization of the oil exploration industry hasn't worked out very well. It's because what their contracts are like. They have local content requirements. They're just really onerous. And some of the judges down there have decided, look, if BP comes in here and makes, a, makes an error here and they get sued, we're going to do away with the corporate veil. Okay, we're going to go after the individual stockholders individually. Okay, again, only the French are going to go in there and drill under that. And so when you look at the expected Iranian oil incre increase in oil price, it's not very, nobody's expecting this to go up very much in the next couple of years, so that's not going to be a big problem for us. It has been a big problem in our state, as you can see. Statewide, uh, March over March, we're down 15.5, uh, 15,500 jobs, a decline of 0.8%. We have been losing jobs since August in our state. Uh, it's really hit the mining, what we call the mining, that's where oil and gas extraction is, down about 11,000 jobs. Shipbuilding is way down. Edison Schwest, you know, had a big old shipyard down there. They basically had to shut down with uh, about uh, at least 1,500 workers. It's really hit different areas a lot. Shreveport, down 1,800. Homa, down 6,500. Look at that, 6.6%. 6 .6%. Lafayette, <clears throat> down 9,300, 4.3%. What you're seeing going on in the oil patch is absolutely nothing like the early 80s. Those people who think that we're going to have the early 80s over, over again, that's mathematically impossible, just so you'll know that. In, in 1981, we had about 105,000 people employed in the oil and gas extraction. It was crazy. And then when the bust occurred, that dropped down to about 45,000. We only went back up to about 48. Okay, we got very tight. <clears throat> the lenders got very tight with their money, and we've now dropped down to about 40. There, it's, it's mathematically impossible to lose 60,000 jobs. There are not 60,000 jobs out there. Homa lost 24% of the jobs between 81 and 87. <laughs> that's not going to happen this time. Lafayette lost 19%. There's no way that's going to happen. This is bad, but it's nothing like the early 80s. There was, a matter of fact, there was a, you probably, you know, in 87, there was a home homecoming parade at U. Uh, U.S. Well, go to University of Southwestern Louisiana, it was called at the time. There were only two floats in 1987. One was by the U-Haul trailer people, one was by the FDIC. That was the only people who could really get anything done. So that's the bad news. Now the good news is what's going on in most of your areas here, and that's what's going on in the chemical industry. Major industrial rebound going on. To give you an idea, <clears throat> I've been watching the economy now for about four decades. In a really good year in the past, if we had $5 billion in industrial announcements, we would have thought that is really great. Uh, working with uh, Connie and her group together, uh, the, the latest real survey is about almost $144 billion. This is enormous. We've never had experienced anything like this before. <clears throat> Highly concentrated by industry. About $51 billion is in chemicals. About $70 billion is in LNG export terminals, all of those over in the Lake Charles area. Highly concentrated geographically. Baton Rouge to New Orleans, about $44.5 billion and Lake Charles, $93.3 billion. Just a huge, thank you, such a huge numbers for Lake Charles, just unheard of. Now, and as a result, look at the employment numbers here. Look at the employment numbers in Baton Rouge and Lake Charles. Uh, Lake Charles up 3,100, which is a 3.1% increase. And from an employment standpoint, that is really good. Their construction in, up about 47 Baton Rouge up 10,300, up 2.6%. Our construction up 5,000. So, you got these two pockets doing really, really well in, in uh, Louisiana, and that's the Lake Charles and Baton Rouge area associated with this. Now, what's going on? <clears throat> well, there are two factors regarding natural gas. I don't tell you folks this. This is a picture of the price of natural gas from 1990 uh, through 2015. And this time period here, one, two, three, four, five, six years in which the price of natural gas was very high, 
was actually crushing to the, to, the, to, the petro, to the chemical industry because you folks use a huge amount of natural gas. And so uh, during that time, almost all the ammonia plants moved offshore. And then the price of natural gas has dropped down where today it's at $2.20 per million BTU instead of $10, okay? And so suddenly you've got all, one of the major inputs into your production process has gone down a lot and so you're starting to expand, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is this picture here. That red line is the price of natural gas in Asia. This yellow line is the price of natural gas in Europe. And then the blue line at the bottom is the price of natural gas in the United States. They were all kind of together back here, and then suddenly the price of natural gas went way up in Europe, way up in Europe, uh, uh, way up in Asia, way up in Europe, way down in the United States. So suddenly our chemical firms had a tremendous competitive advantage over chemical firms in Asia and in, in Europe because the price differential for this major input was so different. You say, why is, there, why is their price so high? And the reason their price is so high is because in the case of Europe, they have to import their natural gas. And they buy it from Russia, and Russia prices their natural gas off the price of oil. And they'll basically take about 15% of the price of oil, and that's what they'll charge for a million BTU. So when the price of oil is $100 a barrel, they're taking 15% percent of that $15 charging, that's, that's what they were charging the European chemical companies, where ours were getting natural gas for three bucks. There's no way they could compete with us. And so that is one of the major impetus behind this impetus, behind this, uh, behind this big exp explosion in output. Now, that's really great, except look out here on the ends. Look what's, what's been happening in Europe and in Asia. The price of natural gas has been coming down because the price of oil has been coming down. You take 15% of 40, okay, suddenly that gap, that wonderful competitive advantage we have has started to narrow. So it's real, and, and as a result of that, some of these announced projects have taken their foot off of the accelerator and started tapping the brakes. So, well, we better wait and see where the price of oil ends up. Is, are, is Goldman Sachs correct? Is the price of oil going to go to 20 and settle there? That changes everything. <coughs> But if the price of oil goes back up, so the more it goes up, this little bump up from 35 to 45 is once again expanding that competitive advantage that we have over other countries. Now, <clears throat> now this is important because if you look at that $1.144 billion of projects, $65 billion is underway, but there's still $79 billion that hasn't gone vertical yet. Okay? Now, $65 Compared to five is a lot. That's why Baton Rouge and Lake Charles are doing so great. But we have that much at risk. And what's kind of interesting is if you look across the different areas, in Lake Charles, about half of theirs is underway, but about 50 billion is at the feed stage. If you look in uh, Baton Rouge, most of ours is underway, very little at the feed stage. In New Orleans, most of theirs very little of theirs is underway. Most of theirs is at the feed stage. So there's a lot at risk here for these folks. Very important for these things to move from feed to going vertical. <clears throat> and, of course, what all these people know and what a lot of government leaders don't know is this decision about whether or not to go vertical is basically math. <laughs> you're sitting down and you're figuring the rate of return on equity, Right? And so when the people at the pointed building start filling around with taxes and regulations, that matters a lot because we are in deep competition with Texas. Texas presents to you folks the exact same assets that Louisiana does. And if we don't remain competitive with Texas, it's a matter of math. Those facilities are not going to go vertical. So what they ultimately end up deciding down there is really, really critical. I'm not sure how much they know that. It is math. They are attorneys. I, I shouldn't have said that. That's a very tacky. Should have said that. I, I, which reminds me of the story of the preacher and the attorney at a cocktail party chatting around. And the preacher says to the attorney, says, what happens if you make a mistake in a big case? What do you do? And he said, well, if it's a big mistake, I fix it. But if it's a little mistake, I just let it go. How about you? And the preacher said, well, pretty much the same. For example, last Sunday I was giving the sermon and I, I meant to say the devil is the father of all liars, but I ended up saying the devil is the father of all 
lawyers, I just let it go. <laughs> anyway, now, let me finish up by saying this. I know, you, I know you're struggling with a lot of stuff that's going down at the point of building. You're worried about what's going on down there, and I think that's right. <clears throat> but I've got to tell you something. Thank God we live where we live in general. Now, most people know who this dude is. This guy is uh, Karl Marx, uh, a friend of one of our presidential candidates, and this is Adam Smith. Most people don't know who this guy is. There's a reason, his initials, there's a reason why his initials are BS. Anyway, uh, this is Adam Smith. This is Adam Smith. A lot of people don't know him. He's the father of economics, wrote the first economics textbook in 1776. Had two very different ideas about how economies should be run. Karl Marx said, from each according to his abilities, to each according to his needs. You do nothing else tonight. You get down on your hands and knees. You thank God Almighty that somebody else isn't deciding what your needs are. They never understand your needs the way you understand your needs. He said, the theory of communism be summed up in one sentence. Abolish all private property. You do nothing else tonight. You get down on your hands and knees, and you thank God Almighty that you can own your own car, you can own your own house, you can own your own business. You can't do that in a communist society. Adam Smith, however... Says this long involved sentence. Competition alone can regulate price with equity. It alone restricts them to moderation with very little. It alone attracts certainty with certainty provisions where they are wanted or labor where it's required. That basically is a long sentence that said the best technique ever invented by human beings to decide how much of something should be produced and what its price should be. How many people should be employed, what their wage rate should be, is good old supply and demand. Which one of these guys had the best ideas? Well, as it turns out, we had this neat little market experiment that occurred a little over 50 years ago between North Korea and South Korea. North Korea went the way of Karl Marx. By 2003, 50 years after that split, their real gross domestic product was only $1,300 per person. Percent below poverty is so large they don't want to report it. Percent in agriculture, they have 30% of their people in agriculture, and they're still starving. United States, we have less than 2% of our people in agriculture. We, serve, we, we feed all of ourselves and most of the rest of the world. Compare that to South Korea, whose GDP per capita is 11 to 12 times higher than that in North Korea. Percent below poverty, only 4%. Percent in agriculture, only 3.6%. But you know what? These are, just, these are just numbers. Let me show you a better measure of economic health. This picture was taken by a satellite of the United States back in December of 2004. Okay? That's what the United States looks like at night by satellite. This area down here is what South Korea looks like by satellite at night. This is what North Korea looks like at night, folks. There's not a light on in North Korea. As a matter of fact, if we back this up a little bit, this is Japan, this is South Korea here. This vast dark area here <clears throat> is the USSR in Red China. You do nothing else tonight to get on your hands and knees. You think God Almighty that sometime, somewhere in the past, my ancestors decided to go the way of Adam Smith instead of Karl Marx. Because I guarantee you, that made all the difference in your lives. Enjoy being with you folks today. Thank you for the invitation. Why are alliances like this so important to our community? These kind of alliances help to provide some stability and uh, make our region more competitive. So when we interact with our plants and our contractors who work in the plants, we're able to implement programs that help, th help the plants do things in a more s consistent and common way. That in turn um, helps the contractors be more efficient, helps the plants be more efficient in communicating their needs to training providers and the contractors and so forth. So it definitely, it, it, we're helping to make uh, the region more competitive. And where can people get information about Gabria? Uh, folks can get information at our website, uh, gabria.org, or 225-769-0596 is our phone number.